Good afternoon. Welcome. We're about to begin this afternoon's webinar. We'll give a moment or two for people who are still entering the program to join. And then I'll do formal introductions and we'll kick off this panel discussion, digital dialogue, we're calling it. So freshen up your cup of coffee or bottle of water and we'll get started in just a moment. Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Patrick Sieb and I am Director of Economic Development and Placemaking with Destination Medical Center, a state supported initiative to grow and diversify the Rochester economy. I am joined by colleagues, Lisa Clark, Chris Shad, and Bill Von Bank, and by our partner in this webinar, John Isham of Rochester Area Builders. Like all of you at this event and on the panel, we are deeply concerned and care about how to protect the health and economic security of those in the construction trades. Governor Waltz, while calling on Minnesota's, Minnesotans to stay at home to slow the spread of COVID-19, has declared construction services an, a, as an essential good. And furthermore, as he looks to open, reopen the economy and bring more workers in more industries to come back, he has asked the Department of Health and Department of Labor and Industry and Department of Employment and Economic Development to work with the business community, those of you on this webinar and on the panel, to develop best practices to provide for worker and customer safety. And it, it, it is in that context that we are hosting this digital dialogue with leading experts in the health and construction services. And we are very excited by this esteemed panel, and I will make an introduction of each of them, and then we will hear from them and invite you to participate in this discussion by using the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. We, um, they have brief prepared remarks, and we'll facilitate a discussion and a dialogue and again, we'll invite you to participate. Before we begin, or as we begin, I should say, I will, revert, I will introduce in reverse order uh, those who will be presenting. So Mike Benneke, who is the Executive Vice President of Benneke, a company Rochester-based that self-performs much of its, pro many of its projects. So they have, as their employee base, people in the trades themselves. Jay Vanderlust from Kraus Anderson, Director of Safety for Kraus Anderson. Kraus Anderson, of course, known across the state of Minnesota and Wisconsin and North Dakota for its construction services. Troy Blizzard, Vice President of Operations for Mortensen. Mortensen, a Minneapolis anchored company with a presence all over the country including the state of Washington. And I think we're all gonna be interested to hear about their early experiences in addressing construction safety in Wisconsin, and in Washington rather. Two nurses from Olmstead Public Health, Olmstead County Public Health, Krista Seymour and Molly Smith, both technical specialists um, who are guiding the work of Olmstead County and our community. And Dr. Jack O'Hara, infectious disease specialist uh, with Mayo Clinic. Uh, in addition to his role as a physician and infectious disease specialist, he leads the prevention and control work at Mayo Clinic. Before we turn to Dr. O'Hara, I want to um, introduce John Isham. 
John is the executive director of the Rochester Area Builders, which includes a eight county district around Rochester. And its members include people in the construction and building trades industry. So John, thank you so much for um, invite, uh, joining us um, in this process, partnering with us and getting the word out. But I'll give you the floor to uh, make a bit of an introduction. And then we have a couple of questions for the audience before we go beyond that. So John, please. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, as uh, Patrick said, I'm Executive Director of Rochester Area Builders, and we are the Builders Association for uh, Southeast Minnesota. And with that, we are affiliated with the National Association of Home Builders. And what makes uh, today uh, the uh, an appropriate time to have this conversation is it is NHB's National um, job, job Safety Stand Down uh, to help uh, educate workers on, on how we can uh, prevent the spread and, and, and keep our site secure. So I'd like to thank DMC for putting this webinar on and I'd like to thank the member companies that are participating, the true experts with their boots on the ground as we have this very important conversation. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, John. So it's fair to say that this conversation is part of a larger conversation going on around the state and around the country. And we hope to contribute to the best practice and the thinking as this uh, continues to develop. With that, we wanted to ask you two questions, you, the audience, two questions. And the first one, just to give us a sense of where you are all from, uh, we're gonna put a poll on the front of the screen that would just take you a moment to respond to, which helps us understand um, where you are uh, located There's four options, as you can see. You just choose one. This is not a multiple choice. Great. Uh, why don't we take a look to see who is the makeup of this audience today? Great. So we have a strong showing from folks right here in the Rochester area. And then we have a large number of people from coming or from other parts of Minnesota. It's wonderful. Um, we have a couple of people or a few people coming from nearby states. And um, apparently those uh, people coming from other parts of the country. So uh, it's the beauty of this kind of platform is we can draw audience and, and invite people in. And this is really a great showing. So thank you. Uh, our pollster, Aaron O'Brien, who's magically working things behind the screen. We have another question. Again, this is a question that will help us and help the panelists in shaping their presentation. So um, Aaron, if you'll bring up the next poll, this is a question that we'd like you to help us understand what you wanna learn today. What are you most hoping to come uh, to hear about as a part of this presentation? I'll just say on this, feel free to check more than one box. Give you all a, another moment or so to do this. While we're waiting for the um, remainder of you to read through and respond to questions, I'm going to queue up Dr. O'Hora, who I should say Dr. O'Hora, I trip up over that, uh, my apologies, uh, but I do it every time, so at least I'm perfect. Everybody does. It's a yes. name that just lends itself to mispronunciation. Hello everyone. Well, I'm a uh... before you, before you jump in. Let's take a look at the results. Um, see what see what people are asking to hear about. So we'll take a moment to look at this. And you may have to scroll up a little bit, Aaron, or down. Okay, I guess we can see everything. 
Okay, so looks like people want to hear about just about everything we had on the screen and we're going to kick off by um, maybe the first one which is on the screen and this is one Dr. Ohoro uh, you can help us with. How does this virus work anyway? Sure. So the understanding of this particular virus is something that we've been coming to understand uh, over time over the past few months. Of course, this is something that even as recently as Christmas time, really nobody had heard about. And because of that, there's been a lot of work done to try to understand that since then, and a lot of information coming out really on a daily basis and sometimes an hourly basis about what causes us to be at higher risk or what can we do to keep ourselves safe. And oftentimes these things are, um, are competing or even mixed messages or contradicting previous messages because of that. This has given rise to a lot of what I'll call the myths about COVID at right now as we're starting to understand it further. And I want to talk a little bit about some of those myths and answer those specific questions as well. The first myth that I'm hearing a lot of these days is uh, social distancing isn't working or that social distancing isn't important. Now, social distancing refers to things like the stay at home order where we've been trying to keep people further away from each other. You might notice in grocery stores and other places, markers to keep people six feet apart so that they don't effectively transmit the virus. This seems to have had a fairly drastic effect in Minnesota because the, there is some information to suggest that in the day to two days before someone actually becomes sick with COVID, they can be shedding virus and have potential to infect others. Because of that, this social distancing and essentially the pause we've been under has been key to reducing the rate at which this increases. But hitting that pause button has also allowed for some work to be done to try to understand what are some alternative strategies we can use as we get beyond the point that this uh, stay at home order has been in place, which gets to the next myth that I hear frequently is that masks are not really necessary. Uh, you'll see our public health nurse are actually wearing masks today as a good demonstration of what people can do when social distancing isn't practical and they don't have a wide angle camera so they have to be closer than six feet. But what the masks are really good for is making sure that you don't spread the virus. I'll say one of the sub myths of this is this belief that a, the mask is to protect yourself and that's really not the purpose of it. The mask is to protect everybody okay. else. Wearing something okay. that covers your face, sorry, your face or mouth and nose really helps make sure that you don't shed virus. And by doing that, you can make sure that you're protecting your neighbors from any sort of cough, sneezes, or even touching your face, which is something that we all do frequently and don't realize is a potential way of spreading that. Um, that gets to the four, uh, third myth here, which is if I'm healthy, I don't have to worry about this. That's not exactly a myth. That one is, you're probably not going to get it as uh, severely as most. Uh, you don't have to worry about as severe illness on average. Most people who get this illness, about 80% of them have very mild disease or don't even realize that. But saying that you don't have to worry implies that you also don't have to worry about your neighbors or your community members who might be carrying that around who you don't know their health problem. So if you're healthy, you're probably not going to get sick with this to the same extent as others, but you're also probably going to uh, be able to spread it to some of those other people. So that consideration wearing that mask stays important. Getting into the specific group I'm talking to today, uh, I, another question that came up a few times in preparing for this is that is uh, construction workers are going to be at higher risk than most. I do not think that's true. And the main reason for that is some of these measures that we're talking about, like wearing a mask and being considerate of safety practices are things that you have to do on a daily basis for other reasons with all the other uh, protective equipment you do in your job. You do things a lot riskier, honestly, than dealing with COVID, but you are used to managing that risk by using proper equipment consistently. If you take that same approach to hand washing and to wearing masks, I think construction workers, just by nature of being used to doing these kinds of things with consistency, will probably be one of the lower risk jobs to reopen. Finally, there is the myth coming around that this will all be over soon or this will all be over by summer with the weather coming. The truth is oh, no. nobody I think really you have knows bad, I think you have that. bad news. And that gets I think you have bad point. news coming for us. I think you're about well, to give us bad news. That one, 
Yes, the bad news on that is that summertime is not reliably going to end this. Uh, there's been a lot of work done to what we call flatten the curve and make sure that this isn't going to happen quickly, that we aren't going to have a peak where we run out of hospital beds like you might have heard of happening in New York or in other countries. But that also has spread out the amount of time that this will occur over. Predictions that say that this will end because of warmer weather are really not scientifically based at this point, and I think we have to be ready to prepare for this being a new normal for the next several months at least. I think it's very manageable within some of the measures we discussed in here, but it's important to not forget that this is uh, going to be something that we're not just going to deal with for this week and next week. So those are my five myths on COVID, and I'll open up to the next topic of discussion here. Thank you. I think that that is a great primer and a, and a great start. Uh, I am going to come back to you, just forewarn you. You're going to have to explain this whole antibody thing and testing and what all of that means. There's a lot of stuff out there, but I'm going to let you prepare for that because I think it's just so complicated that you're going to have to reduce it so I can understand it. Um, in addition, um, I'm, we're going to, one of the questions and, and, and maybe our friends at Olmstead County Public Health can talk about this, Molly and Krista, it's appreciate you joining us. And I know you guys are on, uh, and be, be sure you turn your uh, mute buttons off, by the way, because um, between the mask and the mute button, we wouldn't be able to hear you. So uh, looking, to, looking to you for um, insights about uh, practices that you're seeing emerge in other industries that might apply to the construction trades. Sure. So some of the um, things that we're noticing or that we're hearing that other industries are doing and some recommendations um, that are being given include um, the so it's just like um, like staffing changes. So trying to make sure that the same people are working with the same people each day. So um, if that is, is something that can be possible, just trying to keep the same groups of people together. Um, another, another thing is um, having the same people on the same jobs as well. Um, and trying to, having teams out at, at jobs together, um, just to try to eliminate the, the people that are coming in contact with each other and keeping the ones that are working together with each other. I would also oh, add before that you go on, I'm sorry, before you go on, uh, Molly and Krista, I'm hoping uh, Jay and Mike and, and Troy that you're taking note and, and I'm, I'll be interested in your reaction to some of the ideas that are emerging um, in other places, in other industries for other workers and maybe things you've already tested or things you, you're learning that, that could apply. And, and moreover, the, the myth busting that Dr. O'Hurl um, talked about, um, I'll be curious about how um, that myth busting will help your um, thinking about job sites. And Molly, I'm gonna give you the floor in a second, but just a reminder to the audience, the Q&A button is, is live and uh, we'll welcome any questions that populate and, and we'll, um, we'll bring those uh, bef before the panelists. So feel free to use the Q&A button. Molly, please. I was going to add along with the same individuals working together is to use have individuals assigned to certain equipment and try not to share that equipment as much as possible. Um, we're also seeing people wearing masks like the cloth mask that we're wearing is a good um, way to stop the spread. Um, also, when you're wearing your work gloves to use hand hygiene when you're um, before you wear them and then again when you're through wearing them. So I think you said, um, as we were setting up and preparing for this, that you are tech specialists in the in the command center. Did I hear? Yep. That What's is the correct. command center? What's the command center like? Give us a peek behind the curtain. <laughs> um, it's a busy place. It's it's where our incident command structure is housed. Um, EOC stands for emergency operations center. So everybody who's working in the incident command structure um, is housed there and working together. There is um, 
several different teams, planning, operations, safety. Um, our role is housed in the safety um, scope of that. And so, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of moving parts working together to have um, hopefully some really great positive results coming out of this. One of the, one of the things that um, I think people are, inter people are interested in is what is the guidance um, that you're providing that um, public health is providing regarding how long a vi the virus lives on different services? Um, uh, metal or plastic service surfaces compared to compared to fabric surfaces or garments. So the information that we've seen is that the virus can live on a material of copper for about 24 hours. I'm sorry, about three hours. Um, it can stay on cardboard for 24 hours and some plastics and steel for about three to four days. Okay. So that's, uh, that's probably information you didn't have, Troy, um, looking at you and the Mortensen team, information you may not have had um, uh, in the early days with your teams working in the state of Washington. And uh, I, think of, I think of you because of your presence uh, all over the country, but in the, in the West Coast in particular, as having a bit of a running start in terms of thinking about worker safety. And I'm just interesting to, interested to hear um, what you, kind of the evolution in, in the experience that you've had and maybe some of the early days um, in the state of Washington. Uh, appreciate that. Um, what, what's interesting is you say early days and that was you know three, four weeks ago. <laughs> and in the, uh, right. the, life of, the life of a lot of things that we've, we've dealt with, um, this whole COVID experience, like days feel like weeks and weeks are feeling like months. Um, just the yeah. amount of changing information and uh, uh, the reaction time that we've had to changing policies, changing laws, changing governor's orders. So yeah, the, to your point, uh, I'm gonna share a few nuggets about um, what we've been able to, um, maybe more specifically for me, I'm based in Minneapolis. And so we've got to hear the experiences of our construction um, operating groups that are in other parts of the country uh, specifically Seattle is one of the more in interesting for this call that they, they basically had the rush two to three weeks ahead of us. And so uh, our, our focus has been uh, uh, communication. So we've had you know, a combination of say company-wide calls and then group level calls and then calls to our, our own operating groups and then the individual conversations on job sites uh, has really been a, a core to us sharing what's, what's been kind of going on around the company or around the country. But maybe a couple uh, quick facts just that might uh, um, give some perspective on me being able to answer some questions better uh, maybe later in the session. Uh, Mortensen's, we've got about 5,000 employees that split about 50-50 between craft and non-craft. So to Mike Medici's point and that focus on self-performed work, um, going through this adventure with a lot of your own team members on the, the quote-unquote front lines, like boots on the ground, along with multiple partners, uh, has been uh, has been a big deal of kind of in this in this together theme. Uh, so the, the cooperation that we've uh, that we've had in Minneapolis with uh, a lot of other general contractors uh, with AGC with the building trades, uh, it's been really cool to see. I mean, it, there is there has been absolutely a theme of we are all in this together and we're going to figure out and share best practices and what are you doing and what have you seen and. Uh, I think that's uh, unprecedented on us um, in a typically very competitive industry. This has been a wide open, what are we doing to make sure that we're creating the safest environments for our, our team members that are still essential and in, in, in working on job site. Um, um, you know, you, you said something, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, okay. but you said something about the level of collaboration occurring the, in what are otherwise competitive environments. Mm -hmm. um, and I know all three of you quite well, and you compete very aggressively whenever we uh, uh, have projects here in Rochester. And we, we appreciate that competitiveness, but we really appreciate the collaboration. And maybe, John, that's really where you and your organization has really created a platform for collaboration between, um, between people in the industry. And, and I think this notion of, of, uh, of open source, open source, um, I noticed on the Krauss Anderson website, you have, uh, you have everything you are doing and your approach to it just 
out for anybody to look at and, and sharing it with your competitors. And I just think that's one of the, one of the, probably the most impressive things that has come out of uh, this pandemic crisis we're facing is the level, level of collaboration that is occurring. And, and I'm gonna ask Jay to just talk about that. And, and uh, Jack, I am gonna ask you to talk about collaborations that Mayo is involved with that, that might be a bit unprecedented as well. So Jay, and, and I'll come back to you, Troy, but Jay. No worries. Uh, yeah, as a construction company, general contractor, construction manager, we are considered a, uh, a multi-employer worksite, which we're working with many other trade partners on these sites. So what sure. we do and try to implement for our own employees, we're doing it for our trade partners as well. And the biggest thing that we found out is communication, communication, communication. You cannot communicate enough. From the get-go, we've developed our own information to provide our employees, which then is shared with our trade partners through our foreman meetings, toolbox talks, things of that nature, just to spread the word regarding this whole COVID-19 coronavirus, just to make sure everybody's familiar with the hazards associated with it and what each individual person and employers need to do to respond to it. You know, as a controlling contractor and job site, yeah, we can provide portable wash stations and clean up handrails and doorknobs and provide different uh, uh, means and methods of to help spread, but each individual person and their own employers need to do their own as well. So the big thing, like I said, is communication. Whether you're coming on our job site for the first time, the first thing you're going to see is one of our questionnaires to get out of the job site to make sure you don't have any symptoms or sick. Uh, once you're on the job site, to continue monitor yourself and your your foreman, your trade leadership group is going to be monitoring as well to make sure you're not sick throughout the day. Recognize those signs and symptoms. Remove them from the job site immediately. Uh, once we have a yes answer on our questionnaire or someone is told that they're sick throughout the day or maybe even get a phone call the night before, uh, there's certain parameters that we have in place to respond to a yes answer and or sickness in the workplace in which we'll follow to the T, which is based off the Minnesota Department of Health, Center of Disease Control, and which will respond to each of those individually. Um, all our job sites, I think, are signed and posted uh, throughout all common areas. Anytime somebody's coming through the main door, any common areas, uh, we have flyers and posters and information that details the various different hazards that are associated with it, instructional information. Uh, we got CR scan. Um, there you go, we got some pictures popping up. We got some different uh, communications that set up. We got the CR scans. You can scan with your telephone to get some additional information through our website. Um, just constant communication. That and as so, well as the partnership. I, I, Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I appreciate uh, your comments about communication and, and informing the workforce. I, I particularly, when you shared this picture, picture, I particularly enjoyed. I'm not sure if I can, if we can make this any larger, but I enjoyed There's two reading. pictures there. Oh, just, if we just do the one picture, uh, Aaron, if that's possible, um, or maybe it is only one picture. Uh, I, oh, there's two pictures. One of the one is of the elevator controls in which we're only utilizing our skips. We call them in the business uh, for material delivery and tool delivery only. Uh, everybody else should be using the stairwells so that we don't have that uh, uh, social distancing limitations in an elevator where it's tight and confined space at the beginning. You know, weeks ago we had elevators when everybody shows up to work at six or seven in the morning, you got 20 people cramming in there. Well, we recognize that that's a possibility of an exposure. So we limited that as far as uh, just for the operator themselves and maybe one person that's assisting with the delivery going up and down to the various different floors. The picture to the right just shows uh, one of our larger job sites where we do have a lot of manpower, people power on the job sites in which regular cleaning of routine surfaces uh, you can see the individual with the spray bottle of cleaning disinfectant, his gloves, and he's washing down handles, uh, doorknobs, um, stair rails, anything of that nature that uh, people are touching on a regular basis. Those get routinely washed and cleaned uh, multiple times throughout the day. Well, I, I particularly enjoyed the communication on the elevator picture where you did help people understand that they should put their tools on the, on the skip, as you said, and that they need to walk the take the stairs and I think if we read closely um, and I'm looking closely at my screen here I'm not sure I'm going to be able to read it exactly but I think it does say sorry for the inconvenience but this is the decision of upper management so I think in this case Molly and Krista you are the upper management that 
providing the kind of guidance that uh, helps uh, direct how to move safely about a construction site. Mike, are you uh, taking temperatures of everybody coming on the site? I'll unmute, yeah. Um, that is something that we've implemented and I think many, many construction firms have implemented as well as a pre-reporting to work, temperature taking, and then also um, after work. So twice a day, uh, we're asking that people take their temperatures. <laughs> And the, fo the photo is, uh, of course, me, but it's a, it's a metaphor for something that's much, much more broad. And many industries are implementing this for people to enter their work site, whether it's construction or any industry. Um, so, I mean, we've been, I think, uh, like many, following information, um, using our trusted sources to, um, to determine new guidelines and implement them, for, whether it's been from the Mayo Clinic or CDC or Minnesota Department of Health. But then there's also the trade organizations like AGC. They've, they've been in a tremendous leadership role. Um, and then the, the trade unions as well have been very helpful. There has been a, a terrific amount of cooperation and a collaboration among uh, industry-wide, whether it's general contractors or uh, subcontractors or just everyone that's touching the industry. And I think you're seeing that on a national scale across uh, sectors, but um, in construction, you know, safety is the number one priority of every construction firm. And that does put uh, us in a collaborative environment because there is no competition in safety. And many people have been forthcoming with what they're doing on job sites, whether it's posting photos or their documentation, their plans, uh, their toolbox talks, that's all been uh, very open and shared. And it's helped the industry uh, speed up its understanding and implementation of safety precautions. Because it, it wasn't more than, uh, like Troy had mentioned, I mean, maybe a little more than a month ago that many, many sites did not have anything different in place. And we're only five weeks from that and it has been completely changed and it continues to change. And um, I think as Dr. O'Horo mentioned that the construction industry is somewhat in a good place to um, assess risk and mitigate risk uh, inherently. I mean, we do that on a, on a daily basis with understanding what work tests are happening, looking at the hazards and then mitigating those hazards. And this scenario is completely different than a normal construction risk scenario. It's a global health situation. Uh, but the way we go about assessing risk and uh, changing our behavior to manage it, that's somewhat similar and people are used to that. So you do see, I think, great adoption and great uh, teamwork and adaptability among the trades because uh, I think people are used to implementing safety uh, protocols to manage mm -hmm. risk. And so yeah. everyone's kind of in it together in that way. And, you know, the construction industry, many people want to keep working and they understand that it's an industry that is allowed to keep working based on uh, the governor's order. Uh, but if not done properly, that there's a chance that that maybe would not continue. And so there is a, a bigger, um, a bigger picture that people are seeing and um, basically doing our part as an industry to slow the spread and to keep job sites safe. So one of the one of the questions that have um, come in through the Q and A box, and by the way, I'm going to encourage the panelists to um, uh, to take a look when you can at the at the Q and A and pick one or two questions that you think you're best prepared to answer. And, and in a few minutes, we'll do sort of a lightning round, and we'll try to get through as many as possible. But there's no way there's no way I can. Uh, uh, field all of these questions. I, so I think it'll be helpful and they're really great questions and I think it'd be helpful if you if you looked at them and, and could identify those that you think or one or two that you think you could you could answer. So what I'm going to do after I have a question for Mike, but uh, what I'm going to do is after we're done with that to um, to invite you to identify one of those questions, say, read it back so people know what you're talking about and, and respond to it. Uh, but before I do that, Mike, and as people are looking um, give people a moment to do that. But uh, Mike, uh, 
I, one of the questions we've heard about is um, with the uh, warm weather coming, and it is, and in some parts of the country it already is warm. So this additional safety gear that we see Molly and Crystal wearing the masks, masks um, uh, like how much is that, you know, what do you do to keep workers safe when it's hot weather and they're wearing uh, hard hats and they're wearing gloves and they're wearing steel toe boots and they're wearing long sleeve uh, pants and, sh and, and shirts and uh, safety glasses and now masks. Um, what do, how do we manage uh, how do we manage worker safety when it's uh, when we're we're getting hot temperatures hot temperatures coming well I'll try that I think Jay would be in a great position to to respond to that as well but um, you know as the temperatures do rise you know uh, we do continue to wear you know long sleeves long pants I mean those are uh, safety measures um, the masks, I think, are going to become more prevalent, cloth masks on job sites. And of course, we are limiting the use uh, of N95 respirators as best as possible to save those for the healthcare workers. Um, but there, there will be a lot of cloth masks wearing. Some uh, job sites are requiring them. And then, of course, the CDC is recommending them in any public setting where social distancing is difficult to maintain. And that would include, uh, not that a job site is a public space, but there are conditions on job sites where social distancing is difficult to maintain. And so in following the CDC recommendations, we're going to, we're going to have a lot of cloth masks on job sites that will become much more common than it is already. And so you'll begin to see construction workers wearing the cloth masks as a, um, as a, as a way to prevent asymptomatic spread to others, understanding that it's not PPE for yourself. It's, it's for, uh, for the protection of others. Now, as the hot weather um, comes, that might make that more uncomfortable. Uh, we're already seeing some difficulty with cloth masks becoming, uh, you know, allowing fog to come up into people's safety glasses. Um, so we're going to need to continue to improve what cloth masks are available. We've already okay. made changes to kind of uh, prototypes that we've we've had out and. Uh, Another uh, word on collaboration. I mean, we've seen so many people volunteer to, you know, make masks and uh, they've been coming from all sorts of avenues to get out on the job sites. And uh, just yesterday we received another uh, shipment of some cloth masks and those are getting out to sites now. So if, uh, and you, you uh, had suggested, Jay may have some additional comments um, as well, but as we're, as I'm thinking about uh, people listening in on this call, if any of you are looking for a side hustle, it sounds like mask making is going to be a flourishing industry, not just uh, not just immediate, but but long term. Based on um, when you think about it, it's not that many years ago that um, people came to construction sites in shorts and shorts short uh, short sleeves, and maybe didn't weren't mandated to wear a, a hard hat. I mean, those are all relatively new precautions that have been now become state of the art or standard um, standard in practice. And Jay, do you, did you have a, any additional comments on that? I guess I could add a few things regarding uh, hot work environments. And this goes along with hazard communication program with just about any company that you're working with is, especially in the Southern climates, as opposed to up here in Minnesota, we don't typically have to worry about it other than maybe June, July, and August. Uh, other states around the country, it's more relative for them year round. Um, what we are doing where we're working is, if possible, we do job rotation. Uh, if we know that the sun's going to be on one side of the job in the morning and the other side in the afternoon, we'll, we'll rotate uh, work around those areas if possible. Um, we always provide enough uh, drinking water for everybody to uh, hydrate themselves, uh, as well as uh, making sure that if we can put some people in shady areas and cool them down and recognize the signs and symptoms of heat disorders, um, just standard practices sure. for really... Yeah working with heat. So you're really drawing on your practices that you've had well established and in terms of a culture of safety, construction worker safety that predate COVID and, and uh, so you're able to draw on those experiences is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, it's part of the hazard communication, recognizing the signs and symptoms of heat disorders. Dr. O'Hora, tell me about testing. Tell us yeah. about testing. I've seen a few questions about testing roll in and the antibodies in particular. I'll try to address them all as uh, briefly as I can here. 
But um, testing right now really comes in two different flavors. We have a uh, nasal pharyngeal swab, the swab that goes way back in the nose and uh, makes you very uncomfortable and sneeze. That is actually looking for virus in the uh, back part of your uh, of your nose and sinus. Yeah. And that one is the one that we're primarily relying on because if that is positive, that tells us that there is actual virus being identified in you and basically the place where you store all the material that you're gonna cough and sneeze is a very good marker of transmissibility. We currently are really only testing patients who actively have symptoms at this point. The main reason for that is that testing availability nationwide remains somewhat limited, and we want to ensure that when we're using the test, we're using it on people who we really suspect might have illness. That does mean that we are missing people who may not have any symptoms in the first uh, 24 hours, but having said that, it would take a lot more test capacity to really test everybody going on a work site or in a hospital than anyone has right now, so we have to target that. And that's where this is all part of a layered protection strategy. We're relying on the masks to reduce the amount of exposures in that first 24 hours, the temperature taking to be a trigger that somebody might need to get tested, and then the testing to say somebody should actually be taken off work or, uh, and that public health should start working to attract who else may have been exposed. The masks, okay. again, come back to reduce those exposures, but it's all part of a uh, system of just layering the protection because no one layer is completely perfect. Now, the antibody test is looking for your immune response to the virus, and that's relatively new, and we still have a lot of questions about that in the medical field. Uh, we still don't know right now if that really indicates protective immunity, meaning that once you have this antibody, that means that you're not going to get infected, or if it's really just a marker that your immune system is responding but doesn't tell us that it's actually capable of fighting that off. I'm sure everyone's had the experience of having the same cold come back again and again, and that's because for some illnesses and coronaviruses and that same family of cold viruses, you can get infected over and over because your immune response isn't completely effective and doesn't last that long. We don't yet know that for coronavirus, so when using that antibody test, right now we're interpreting it with a lot of caution because while it, might it does tell us you were exposed, it doesn't tell us as much about your risk right now. In the next uh, few months, we'll have more information about that particular test strategy, though. So there's the testing to see if you have an active virus. There's the testing to determine if you've had the virus and you have antibodies. And then there's vaccine, something different yet. Yeah, the vaccine is going to be dependent on some of the immune research in terms of determining what does it take to make a effective immune response that actually protects and prevents that. There is a lot of exciting research going on around that right now. Uh, you had mentioned some of the partnerships that have been formed in construction and healthcare is no different. There are groups that are uh, collaborating on a level that we've never seen before because this has really brought everybody as a creativity and um, cooperation to the forefront. Even with all of that, I don't think we're going to be seeing a vaccine that's going to be ready for wide distribution this year because of the amount of time and development that goes into that, as well as the requisite safety testing. And even with uh, all the promises of cutting of red tape from the FDA and other areas, that doesn't obviate the need to actually make sure that a vaccine is safe, which does take yep. work, even if it's not just to sure. fill out the forms. Sure. So there's testing to see if you have an active virus. There's antibodies to see if you have antibodies after having had the virus. There is vaccines. And then there is treatment, which is yet another, another field of work going on. Is that right? That, that would be correct. And a big question that we all have right now is if that uh, exposure can be used to tell us if you are at a decreased risk, and that's an unknown right now. Okay. So if that's uh, kind of uh, sort of buckets of, of ways to think about this, uh, Molly and Krista, help us understand what happens if a, somebody shows up at a job site only to later that we discover, they discover that they um, have COVID but didn't, weren't symptomatic at the time. What, is, what does that mean for the rest of the workers who had been uh, in that work environment. All right. Um, if someone does um, test positive, 
it does go um, get recorded with the state health department and then a case investigation um, begins from there. So they would be contacted by the state health department um, and then, then they would um, be required to give any contact that they had in the prior um, like week to two weeks. And then those individuals would be followed up with and say you had a potential exposure um, and then they would be placed either on a list of like low, medium, or high risk. And then um, their instruction from being placed in those levels would come from there. So if someone was placed like on medium risk, they should stay home and monitor symptoms um, for 14 days, but they can leave for essential services if they have to go get groceries or go to the pharmacy and get medication. Okay. So this is that whole point that's being made about wearing masks isn't about protecting you, it's about protecting other people. So this is, this is the whole idea that if you want to make sure your coworkers are safe, um, you wear a mask and not so much to protect yourself, but so that you're, you're reducing any kind of spread. Yep. And yeah. And this tracking, the tracking that you're talking about. So if, so there is some, I suppose, some comfort as a, as a, as a worker that to know that if somebody later tests positive, there is a mechanism to inform you that, that somebody you worked with had, um, has developed symptoms. So you're not blindly, you know, you sort of like, they may go off to another job site and you don't expect to see them again, but but they would, there would be this tracking that would, uh, tracing, is that what it's called? Or what's the term that's, that's referred to this? Um, I would call it like a contact investigation. Contact so investigation. Contacts. Yep. And so we work pretty quick on that, right? Cause we don't, we don't want to have um, any like job site outbreaks or anything like that. So we're working hard to prevent the spread um, from happening in the community and on job sites. Okay. So that, again, should give some comfort. And Troy, I'm going to just pivot to you and ask, um, have you been in a situation where um, you have um, uh, needed to uh, do that kind of uh, contact investigation or, or um, informing um, other contractors or other workers that somebody um, developed symptoms at a later date? Yeah, I would. And I'm sure that Jay and Mike have had very similar experiences. It's uh, I, right now, I would still say in the heat of this, it's a daily daily discussion with some team, some member, some subcontractor where uh, we thankfully haven't had too many you know, direct positive tested uh, team members on job sites, but we've had uh, countless, um, I know somebody or somebody at home might have it and isn't being tested. And so we've relied heavily on the CDC risk assessment chart. That's been okay. pretty steady now for a couple of weeks. Where we'll look at that, and to uh, um, uh, Molly's point, we we would we would look at who's low, medium, high risk, and you could pr pretty quickly identify with those common sense, you know, CDC um, methods to say whether there needs to be anybody else from the job site that needs to go home, or if if we continue to maintain that social distancing, we've had some success stories. Uh, we have had a couple um, positive tests on subcontractors that. We had done we had done a good enough job on social distancing on the job site that there wasn't another single person that common sense wise needed to go home. So it's it's balancing our privilege of kind of keeping the economy going and keeping as many people working as possible, but following all the right protocol and um, just our obligation to make sure our job sites are as safe as as they can be for everybody. Troy, you mentioned uh, CDC. Describe that again, the CDC um, guidelines or, or? Yeah, the CDC website. And I, I think everybody's always been in this constant you know, search for truth. Like, what, yeah. where can I go to rely on like a trusted information? And CDC has remained that, that place for us and, and all the collaboration we've been doing in Minneapolis. That, that, is, that has been the best source. Uh, the, they have a risk assessment matrix. Risk, uh, risk assessment uh -huh. matrix okay. that says you know, that tries to identify both on contact and symptoms and travel restrictions. Uh, we we refer to that multiple times a day across the company um, to make sure that we're we're balancing that with all of the different requirements that all the different states are putting in place because it becomes a jigsaw puzzle, just a, a maze of trying to make sure you've got the right decision based on the rules within each state. 
using CDC as that kind of source of the best truth. Great. Jay, was there a, a question that you saw in the, in the Q&A that, that you wanted to help with? Uh, well, I think I saw something about what have we done with a yes answer to one of the uh, questionnaires that we have, or we actually had a uh, positive COVID-19 result or something similar. We did have one occur two Mondays ago on one of our projects that was with our trade partner in which we got a phone call, our project team on a Sunday evening indicating that uh, the owner of the company tested positive. Uh, and this is all verbal over telephone. His wife apparently was tested and found positive. So he tested himself, found positive. And on that same Sunday, he tested 10 of his employees and six out of 10 came back positive. Uh, so we had to deal with uh, who was on our site for that particular trade partner, which we found three of them were. Um, what also threw a kicker in it was one of the, the, the the test that was had wasn't your typical nasal test, it was a blood test, in which we didn't really have a whole lot of information regarding that two weeks ago when this occurred. So I actually made a direct phone call to the Minnesota Department of Health to determine what we're supposed to do with this uh, blood test, antibody test, and how should we treat it. And surprisingly enough, somebody answered the phone call within two rings and gave me a uh, uh, quite a simple answer. Treat it as though it's positive and follow your protocols that you have in place in which we did. Um, we interviewed the company owner, the individuals that were tested positive where they were on site. We collaborated with our project team to see where they were. They were iron workers, so they're pretty much isolated amongst themselves. Um, the job site as a, as a whole, um, three individuals were sent home for uh, self-quarantine for 14 days, according to the protocol. Um, one of them tested negative, so they were able to come back within what we follow uh, 72 hours of uh, non-symptomatic uh, for themselves. Um, we actually shut the job site down. It was on a Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday, no work. And the job resumed back on Monday. This was a construction management agency job site. So we had to have collaboration with the ownership group and their permission to shut down the job. And we wanted to treat this as uh, uh, with utmost respect and dignity uh, for everybody on site, we wouldn't want to have any of our trade partners wondering why we're not taking as much needed protection. Um, it gave us enough time to uh, clean the job site and the common areas within this area, the handrails, stair rails, et cetera. Uh, and everyone was happy with the results and came back to work that following Monday. Super helpful. Mike, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, and while we're doing that, uh, we do have a couple of images that you, some of you shared around social distancing in the job site, and we'll just show those so that, and I think there's one I really enjoyed the, um, and I think it came from you, Jay, of, uh, the, the rope, rope door handle, I want to call it, that is a sort of allow people to use their arm, el elbow or arm to open a door would just make one. Cause I think people are looking for very specific, tangible things. There we go. Uh, very specific, tangible techniques or devices, and um, I don't know which uh, which which of the trades is responsible for rope door handles, but um, whoever it is did a great job. Seems to be quite functional. Mike, you said that Benicky is largely self-performing, meaning you have your own employees, so you can mandate and require their safety gear, personal pr protective equipment on the job site. Can you do that of a, with a subcontractor as well? If you, were, if you had a subcontractor, can you require that they wear masks to the job or any other safety equipment? Yeah, I guess the short answer to that is yes. Um, that general contractor is also referred to as the controlling contractor. Okay. And um, it's, it's our responsibility to maintain a safe job site for everybody that enters it, whether it's a uh, a trade partner, a subcontractor, a supplier, or a, one of the Q and A's was uh, what to do if a salesman comes onto the job site. And um, I think the best, I mean, just to directly answer that question, it would be to call the superintendent ahead of time. But, you know, all of our job sites at this point in time are a kind of a no visitors allowed policy, no unauthorized access, no unauthorized visitors. So unless there's been a uh, predetermined arrangement or appointment um, you know, we're kind of keeping the job sites to the minimum sure. amount of people as possible and that have taken their temperature in the morning and 
ask themselves the three pre-screening questions before they before they come in. I do want to make mention that uh, Jay had mentioned uh, calling the Minnesota Department of Health directly, and we have done that as well. And that is a terrific resource for anybody in the industry or any that has any situation. The phone gets answered immediately, and uh, we've had scenarios. I mean, many of us are being put into um, almost like triage situations where we're reviewing a uh, situation and, and uh, discussing the risk and if there has been close contacts that go down the line. And we found that Minnesota Department of Health uh, has been very uh, helpful in assessing some of those situations. Good. Well, I, I'm uh, hoping that there may be some representatives from Minnesota Department of Health or uh, Department of uh, employment and economic development or, or labor and industry on this. Uh, and I know they're very interested in the conversation that, that we're all having right now. Um, uh, let's just, we're, we're running out of time and we had uh, a lot of great content. We have a lot of questions that we couldn't get to and we'll work on preparing a response that generally tries to address the questions and we'll have that in our blog and make that available to people. But I'd like to just do 10, 15 seconds around the horn to hear if there's any final comments. Um, and the horn I'm looking at has uh, Dr. Ohora um, and then Troy. So, so Dr. Ohora, anything, any final comments or advice? Sure, as I'm just looking through the questions, uh, again here there are a couple of questions about what uh, makes for an effective mask and uh, around that. And really all it has to do is be something that you put over your nostrils and your mouth that can catch a sneeze because our goal isn't to get to an N95 level of protection for filtering is to be able to make sure that when you're coughing or sneezing, you're coughing and sneezing into something. Beyond that, all these things about putting in a coffee filter or anything like that is uh, that ranges from probably not effective or necessary to something that just makes it a little harder to use. So just remember, cover your mouth. Simple and, is better. Sounds like simple is better. Troy, something very uh, practical, anything very practical. Molly and yeah. Krista, you're up next. Yeah, I would say just the, the mantra that there is no substitute for social distancing is going to be important okay. for all of us. I mean, we're going to, we have kind of two fronts to make sure that we can keep everybody working and that's communication, and all the tools and techniques on the job. And then we have the public perception to be aware of as well. That's been that trend around the, the country that not everybody is going to think that construction is essential. Great. So, Molly, and, and that's, that's really important. I mean, that, that, that's a really important point. And as the governor tries to get the entire economy going and is, and he's used the term surgical in his intervention to try to get more people working. It's not just construction workers who are caring about it. Molly and Krista, you're at the front line of making everybody safe. Any final thoughts or comments? Well, it sounds like everyone's doing an excellent job. We're over here smiling from behind our masks for all the efforts that are um, happening. Um, so thanks to Troy, Mike, and Jay um, for making sure all that happens and everybody that's listening for continuing data is showing that our efforts um, are working and helping to flatten the curve. Um, another easy thing to do is hand hygiene. Just hand washing. hygiene, hand yep. hygiene. Okay, Quality Mike. Hand washing. I'm going to have to, Mike. Sure. Um, something that uh, Molly and Krista had alluded to was staffing of the projects. I think that's a great tech technique to um, kind of de-densify a job site. So uh, single piece flow, one trade in at a time. And that does go to one of the questions that came up about how should bidding documents handle COVID-19 precautions? Well, ultimately, I, I do believe that construction schedules will not be exactly the same as they used to be. I think things will start to take a little bit longer because of uh, kind of a single trade in an area at the same time or one person in the area at the same time. Got it. St uh, staffing structure and sequencing. Jay? One thing that I would add, and uh, after having uh, a couple COVID-19 positive or yes answers on our questionnaires to make sure you have yourself a written plan and procedure as far as specifically what your company is going to do in the event that you come across one of these on your job sites. Um, and also continue to look at the CDC and the Department of Health, whatever those uh, leading agencies are that are telling you what you need to do because it's such a fluid topic and what we wrote four months ago, or sorry, four weeks ago 
is totally different than what we have today. Um, Wonderful. So constantly updating it and uh, very uh, good. Make sure you follow your plan. Very good, John. I'm going to give you the last five, last ten seconds, John Aishan, but you have to go off mute if you're going to talk. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would uh, just address the uh, importance of our industry. Uh, Governor Walls is well aware of the challenges of housing, and that's one of the things that our industry provides is uh, a basic human need of shelter, whether it's a multifamily home or a single family residence. And and we've had many conversations with him when he was Congressman Walls too. So. I think that's why one of the, one of the reasons why our, our industry was named critical because we provide that basic human need of shelter, whether uh, whether it's maintaining that shelter if a refrigerator dies or a garage door can't open so you can't get out to get your groceries or that type of thing, um, is is really why we are in, uh, critical. But uh, as my uh, current president has said, and as to the gentlemen have alluded to and the ladies, if, if we don't keep our workers safe, we can't do the jobs anyway. So it's extremely critical that we uh, keep everybody as safe as possible. Well, thank you, John, for joining us. And thank you to all of the participants. This has been an extraordinary conversation around the theme of protecting personal safety, health safety, and economic security. And I can't think of a better panel and a better group of experts to help shape this conversation in Minnesota. Uh, this has been recorded. We will uh, make this available on video and, and we may uh, develop excerpts as well. And um, I just uh, wish there was a live audience to join me in giving all of you a round of applause for this incredible um, work that you're doing and sharing of your expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Be well and be safe. And Dr. O'Hara, I'm going to keep working on getting that, um, getting your name right. Next.